Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Cabinet meeting of the 8th of September. So we'll get straight in with item one. It's apologies for absence. We have received apologies from Councillor Bailey and Councillor Farrell. Uh, item two on the agenda is minutes of the previous meeting. Your wish to sign those true record. Councillor Pritchard moves. Councillor Summers seconds. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, brings us on to declarations of interest. Does any member have any interest to declare? Nope, there are none. So that brings us on to item four, which is question time. Uh, and this is questions from the members of uh, any members of the public. We have two questions this evening. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Martin Hall. So if Mr. Hall's in the room, if you'd like to come up to the table. Um, turn the microphone on, ask your question, and then we'll, we'll respond with the, with the next stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so this question follows on from a previous question that um, the council will recall. So uh, my follow-up question remains the experience that exists within the executive leadership team and others at Tamworth Borough Council. It is, of course, reassuring to have the experience of the Assistant Director of Growth and Regeneration. The scrutiny of the performance of that role, together with the same scrutiny of the specific project, both in value and consequence to the town is of utmost importance to our town. I note that the external support provided by McBain's is not mentioned on their various media platforms, as this is the case, for the example, with their agreement for the regeneration of Kidderminster Town Centre. So when was the support agreed and at what cost to the project? I would also further ask that Council outline in more detail the experience within the executive leadership team the programme manager, the scrutiny committee, cabinet and the audit and governance subcommittee to demonstrate the appropriate level of oversight, understanding and control of the part of the programme that the Borough Council are delivering. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Hall. So you've, you've given me the question you've submitted there and, and the supplementary, so I'll take them both uh, uh, one after the other. No, the first question was a different question. This is, in, in full, the supplementary question. How was it received, Andrew? Sorry. So just on a point of order, Chair, um, questions from members of the public or at Cabinet are restricted to one question um, and then potentially followed up by a supplementary for matters arising out of that question. So as I understand it, there have been two questions asked there um, so if okay, the um, then I will the draw the first part of the question around McBain's and the second part of the question can remain the supplementary question. Thank you. Um, just, just before I answer that, can we make a note to improve the guidance for members of the public when it comes to asking questions so we're clear on that so we don't have this situation, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies for that, Mr Hall. Um, so the executive leadership team are the, uh, the most senior employees within the council. So you've got the chief exec, deputy chief exec, head of paid service, executive director for finance, section one, uh, and section 151 officer, uh, and the executive director for communities. It's implicit within their job roles that they ensure the organisation is managed within the governance structure uh, and budgets approved and also always act in a lawful manner. Uh, that team has the correct skills and experience to ensure that that's the case. Not just for the Future High Street Fund project, but for the entire complexities of a local authority and, and Tamworth Borough Council. For the Future High Street Fund project, there's a specific uh, governance structure uh, which was approved by Cabinet on the 17th of June 2021, uh, where the programme board was set up, which includes uh, the executive leadership team, it also includes the chief executives of both South Staffordshire College and the Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent Local Enterprise Partnership, uh, along with myself as leader of the council. Uh, and since that was formed, uh, we've now inc increased the membership of that board uh, to include the cabinet member for finance uh, and the cabinet member for regeneration, so Councillor Bailey and Councillor Doyle. Uh, full terms of reference of the, of the board uh, and the delivery groups that report to it are available on the Council website and we can get those sent out to you uh, if, if you'd like us to. Uh, the Programme Manager uh, has been engaged by the Council 
uh, and has a, has a proven track record of construction related uh, schemes. Uh, it's also supplemented by some direct employment in terms of a project officer uh, we have dedicated just the, to the project. The second part of your question refers to uh, scrutiny uh, and, and the, the role of, uh, of, of councillors, for, for want of a better phrase. Um, the role of scrutiny and audit and governance committee are set out within the council's constitution and they apply to all activities uh, of, of the local authority. In regards to the Future High Street Fund, the Infrastructure, Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee receives a quarterly report on the Future High Street Fund pro uh, progress and the Audit and Governance, uh, subcommittee, uh, Audit and governance Committee has a subcommittee uh, which looks at these specific project risks and that's on the same quarterly uh, time frame. Um, in terms of the experience and ability of councillors, um, this is something that, uh, that a lot of people uh, make assumptions around. As councillors, we're just lay people who live or represent a business or, or work in, in the town centre. Uh, some of us have been here a long time, some of us not so much. But what we bring is the normal person in the street questioning and approach to, to, to the decisions of the council. So we receive all the technical data and all the information that any of the employed staff and the project uh, officers can bring to us uh, and it's up to us to a scrutinize that uh, and in terms of are things going in the right direction and b direct where where we would like to go uh, so in terms of experience of, of construction and building projects uh, it's it's one of those things that doesn't come as part of the role of being a councillor but it's something that we're expected to engage with and, and get up to speed with uh, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the individual skills of, of each councillor uh, because their role is significantly different to, to the paid staff and the, uh, and the people on the project board. So we still have a supplementary, don't we? Yeah. Is it? Sorry, I've just got to... Um, not putting words into, into Mr Hill's mouth, but he mentioned um, about the external support provided by McBain's as... Uh, we were taking out the supplementary. Um, uh, yes, you can you respond to that. I thought you wanted me to remove that part of the question, though. It, it, it's, it's entirely up to, up to yourself, um, uh, Mr. Hall. The, you're entitled to ask uh, a question at, at Cabinet and usually a supplementary that arises from that question. Um, I okay, know thank you. Had you. Submitted so, two questions. You you have the option of choosing your second question as as a supplementary to the to the first one, if you wish. Thank you. So my second question then is: I accept, and and I completely understand um, uh, the sort of the roles and the the structure of, of 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 council and obviously the background of the people involved. But I think where I come um, from on this is that this is a significant, probably the largest project, um, single project that councillors probably, ever, time with councillors, ever um, engaged in. And I just wanted to sort of ask that, given the size and complexity of this and how important it is, and this is where I'm coming from, this, this is, you know, not really for me or probably anybody in this room, but more for our children, that this project is delivered to the best that it can be. Had council considered bringing in external support that does have the significant amount of experience that a construction project of this type bring them in to help council to deliver rather than sort of put that pressure on you guys okay thank you um the the, the role of, of of mcbain's is to provide that multi uh, multi-skilled support uh, uh, and advice um, so, so that's why we engaged McBain's and within that, uh, since that agreement, we have engaged with, uh, for want of a better phrase, specialists in particular areas. So we, we've come across some particular issues in terms of heritage and what have you, so we, we've engaged specialisms uh, within those. In the build up to, to uh, submitting the Future High Street Fund bid and, and again with the, the levelling up fund bid that went through in July, uh, we have been engaged with the Local Enterprise Partnership uh, in terms of the Staffs and Stoke LEP and the Greater Birmingham and Solihull LEP uh, and we've received not only funding but also expertise uh, through those two bodies uh, as well as the uh, West Midlands Combined Authority. So 
in terms of the support that's out there, we are engaging with partners wherever we possibly can to make sure that when we are bidding for money, we have a sound bid. Uh, and we're also engaging with them and people like McBain's uh, and other multi-skilled groups to make sure that when we are successful with a bid, we have the right people in place to deliver that bid. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be first to admit that the support for delivery of a successful bid across the, across the region uh, has, has not been as great as the support for submitting the bids in the first place. Uh, so, that, so there's a lot of support for bid writing. When it comes to the delivery, all of a sudden we're, we're all looking around. Uh, so, so we have been engaging where, wherever we can and we have been buying in those, those specialisms as we go along because as you rightly identify, um, as a local authority, we won't have those skills on the shelf just in case we need them and we will have to buy them in uh, as and when we do. And you're absolutely right, this, uh, this future high street from project itself is, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, and what we, what we can't do is make the mistakes of the past uh, and we've got to be flexible enough so, so, so when we do deliver, we can, we can mitigate changes in the economy and, uh, and changes going forward in the same way as we focused on retail in the 60s and 70s uh, with the town centre, retail has now changed forever and we're having to deal with that, those issues. So we need to build in that flexibility and have that clear line of sight. So I hope that answers some of your questions this evening. Um, but uh, quite happy to, to have a chat if you, if you want to at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and we do have a second question from the member of the public who is not able to attend uh, so if I could hand over to Andrew Barrett uh, to read out that question. Thank, thank you Councillor Oates. Uh, this is a question um, received from Mr Hugh Loxton uh, and he asks the leader of the council the following. According to Staffordshire County Council it is a Tamworth Borough Council it is Tamworth Borough Council that are responsible for the damaged bus shelter on Victoria Road. With that in mind, could you please provide an update as to when the bus shelter will be repaired or the area made good? Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I have two parts uh, to this answer. Uh, the first one is that the damaged bus shelter in Victoria Road is a Tamworth Borough Council asset, uh, and this is the third time that that bus shelter has been hit by an Arriva bus uh, so far. Uh, initially, the council were not notified of the damage by Arriva, and it was only when we approached them at the bus depot that they admitted liability. Uh, and the, the matter is currently being dealt with by the council and Arriva's insurers. Um, the second part that I wanted to add to this, and I fully welcome uh, questions from, from members of the public, uh, and I encourage members of the public to, to, to ask questions of the council. Um, the reason I'm, I'm raising this is no criticism of the person asking this particular question. Uh, it's it's a, a general statement. This is a street level issue that has been raised uh, at Cabinet. And I wonder if there are other avenues where members can raise those same questions. Uh, and the reason I suggest that is each and every person in Tamworth is represented by three local authority councillors uh, on, on Tamworth Borough Council. Uh, and it is their specific job to represent the people that they're elected for. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is a street issue type question uh, should probably be initially directed at their patch councillor. And if their patch councillor fails to answer it, uh, th then escalate it through to ourselves. So I don't want to discourage questions, uh, but I just want to remind people that there are 30 councillors who are there to represent the people and they're there to be their first point of contact and their, and their bridge between the local authority and, and themselves. So uh, I'd encourage people to, to use their local councillors more often. So that's the answer to that question. I assume there's no supplementary because Mr Loxton's not here, so we can't ask one. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us on to, oh, where am I? Uh, matters referred to Cabinet in accordance with overview and scrutiny procedure rules. Uh, there are none that have been submitted. However, the reports that will be going on later this evening have been, some of them have been through scrutiny and reference will be made accordingly. So that brings us on to agenda item six, uh, which is the quarter one performance report. 
ladies and gentlemen, in front of you, you have the performance reports for April to June 2022. This went through corporate scrutiny on Tuesday evening this week. Um, corporate scrutiny raised a number of issues within the report, uh, which I'll just touch on uh, before we consider the rest of the report. Uh, the first was the Reset and Recovery project, uh, which if members look, uh, is showing a significant bit of red at the moment in terms of the project plan. Um, the reason that is uh, showing in red is because Cabinet colleagues, uh, we agreed to pause the relocation of Marmion House uh, pending the outturn of the lo uh, levelling up fund application. Uh, and the reason we've done that is because uh, the levelling up fund application may provide us with a final solution for a new home for Marmion House. So it would be uh, irresponsible to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds refitting either our property or a rental property uh, if we were going to get a positive response from the levelling up fund in October. Uh, so that's paused momentarily. Uh, however, the other works in terms of the rationalisation of uh, the office space at Marmion House uh, and, and the, the decommission of the, of the rest of the building can, can continue. Uh, the other point on uh, recent recovery, uh, and I apologise, I apologise on Tuesday, um, the smart working element has now concluded. Uh, the report does suggest that it's been removed from the recent recovery programme, but doesn't explain clearly the reason why. Uh, so that piece of work has now concluded. Uh, the Assure uh, software uh, and the lack of progress was raised by scrutiny. Uh, and as I said on Tuesday, we now have that resourced and we have a 12 month deadline, so we've got to do that. This is about environmental health, uh, uh, environmental health computer processes. Uh, so we have to get up to speed uh, before support for our existing system finishes in 12 months time uh, and scrutiny raised that as a concern. Uh, and they also asked for some further feedback on that one. Uh, other areas that were raised include the Net Zero uh, project. Uh, and members will be aware that the Net Zero uh, baseline report uh, will be coming through scrutiny and to Cabinet in the next couple of weeks. Um, and there was a significant challenge there made, uh, which I think uh, is something we need to consider. And it's not, not just what scrutiny said, but in the wider context. Um, the question from scrutiny was, when we're aiming to achieve net zero, how are we going to get through the bits when it becomes more difficult? I think there's a supplementary element to that, and that is how we're going to get through the bits until uh, until government funding or other funding becomes available. Uh, because what we'll probably find is the government funding will determine uh, when we achieve some of the things uh, that we're trying to achieve in that base in, in that baseline report. Uh, the other issues that were raised by scrutiny were around the risk to the economy uh, and cost of living. And we had some discussion around universal credit uh, and the impact on uh, rent arrears. And there's some clarity that scrutiny uh, uh, requested on that, which will be sent to them uh, as, as soon as that's available. Uh, so I believe they were the issues that scrutiny raised. Um, I've just covered the reset and recovery elements. Uh, you will also see uh, the list of corporate, pro uh, corporate projects that are currently running within the report. Uh, and you'll see that some of those uh, Later, one, uh, later on in the report, you'll see that some of those are highlighted in amber or red, uh, but with explanations as to what's going on with those and how we're going to get those uh, back online if we need to. So with that, happy to move the quarter one re performance report. Do I have any questions or comments? OK, Rob, you're, you're seconding that. OK, all those in favour? OK, that is carried. Thank you very much. Brings us on to agenda item seven. Uh, so agenda item seven is the budget and medium term <coughs> financial planning process 22, sorry, 23, 24. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the start of the process that will take us all the way through till February uh, when council will consider uh, the medium term financial strategy for the, for the next three years. So the report in front of us details the latest information and sets out the timeline for the budget setting uh, and the start of the consultation, which will be the 12th of September. Uh, that consultation will include all stakeholders, as many as we, we can possibly engage with, uh, so community groups, members of the public uh, and councillors, and I encourage everybody uh, to get involved in that process 
uh, whether you're a councillor, whether you're a member of the public, or whether you represent a community group or any other stakeholder. Uh, what we will do is the same as last year in terms of uh, councillor involvement. Uh, this is a whole council approach, so councillors will be invited to a number of different uh, sessions where we will explain and discuss uh, the latest set of information uh, and the latest sets of policy suggested policy changes uh, and also the feedback from the consultation when that is ready. Uh, you'll see a bit of information in the report which uh, refers to the uncertainty uh, of, uh, of the government information at the moment uh, relating to not only levelling up but also in terms of uh, our revenue support grant uh, and our, our settlement. We've been promised a multi-year settlement for multiple years uh, and we've had a single year settlement for multiple years. Uh, so at the minute there is still some uncertainty after uh, there is still some uncertainty in terms of what we're getting next year uh, and there will be, continue to be over the, more, over the next three years unless we get that, that clarity. Um, it is the start of the process, a lot of things to consider and it's a moving feast as the economy changes over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we'll be in a position by February to have something to present to full council as a budget. Any questions or comments from Cabinet? No, in that case, I'll move the recommendation uh, that we progress uh, with the uh, with the MTFS uh, and the and the scheme. Seconded Second by Rob Pritchard. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a break. Agenda item eight is the report of the portfolio holder for finance, risk, and customer services, which is Councillor Marie Bailey. Uh, Marie Bailey has submitted her apologies. And because Councillor Pritchard did this report for the previous decade, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to ask Rob to present this report this evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it was more than a decade. <clears throat> the, um, so this is the annual Treasury report, which is a requirement of the Council's reporting procedures, and it covers the Treasury activity for the 2021-22 financial year. <clears throat> the report meets the requirements of both SIPFA Code of Practice on Treasury Management and SIP for Prudential Code for Capital Finance in Local Authorities. Um, the Council has complied uh, with all the professionals' codes, statutes and guidance, and there are no issues to report regarding non-compliance with our approved Prudential indicators. Uh, on the Council's uh, average investment balance, we achieved a return of 2.8, sorry, 0.28%. Uh, against an average return of 0.25, so it's not a particularly good time at the moment for um, money in the bank. Um, the result does compare favourably, though, with our own benchmarking, um, who, where we benchmark ourselves against other local authorities. Um, the Treasury ma management function has uh, achieved an outturn investment income of £212,000 uh, against a, an original estimated budget of £95,000, and that money obviously goes back into services and I'm happy to take any questions from members. Thank you, Councillor Pritchard. Are there any questions or comments from Cabinet members? Everyone's extremely quiet this evening. Uh, Councillor Pritchard. I'll move the two recommendations, Mr Chairman. Second. And Councillor Doyle seconds. All those in favour? That's unanimous. That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, Brings us on to agenda item nine. Again, this is the report of Councillor Bailey, uh, but I will ask Councillor Pritchard to cover this. And this is the write-offs from the 1st of April to the 30th of June 22. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, so this covers the period of 1st of April uh, 2022 till the 30th of June 2022. The appendices cover um, the amounts for each section, and that is council tax, business, race, business rates, sundry income, housing benefit overpayments, and housing. Um, the council puts in all efforts it can to um, re to get money that it is owed. Um, often that's not always the case due to death, uh, business insolvency, or amounts being uh, uneconomical to pursue. So it's prudent to write this off to allow ourselves and our partners, um, you know, some clarity in their expected income for budget setting processes. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but just reassure members that officers uh, do all they can to recover money that is rightly owed to the authority. Thank you, Councillor Pritchard. Any questions or comments from Cabinet members? I've said this before and I'll repeat it. This is, uh, for want of a better phrase, an accounting exercise so we can provide clarity to our partners in terms of anticipated income. 
Tamworth Borough Council, when it comes to debt owed to them, uh, is it has the memory of an elephant. It never forgets. Uh, so whilst we write these off in terms of uh, irrecoverable, uh, or at the moment maybe uneconomical to recover, we will never forget. And if a person crops up uh, that we that owes us money, uh, the, the council will pursue them. Uh, so please be be reassured by that, uh, Councillor Pritchard. Yeah, just uh, there are examples of that in this uh, report, Mr. Chairman. So say it, where we can get it back, it just does. It's just prudent to write it off as soon as possible. Any further questions or comments from Cabinet? Okay, Councillor Pritchard, you've moved. I'll move those. That. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Doyle seconds those. All those in favour? Okay, that's unanimous as well. Thank you very much. That is carried. Uh, item 10 on tonight's agenda is the Statement of Community Involvement and Local Development Scheme. Uh, and this is the portfolio holder for Skills, Planning, Economy and Waste. Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The purpose of this report is to seek Cabinet endorsement of the following report that details the proposal and recommendations. The report looks at the adoption and publication of a new statement of community involvement and also the local development scheme. The Council is required by legislation to publish and keep up to date several documents that sit alongside the local plan and provide information to the public and other stakeholders. The Statement of Community Involvement sets out a strategy for engagement with the local community and other relevant parties in producing a local plan and determining planning applications. And then there is the Local Development Scheme, which enables the local community and other interested parties to keep track of the progress of the development plan documents and to identify points in the process where they are, they are able to participate. The current statement was published in November 2018 and a temporary COVID-19 amendment was uh, added in October 2020. The current local development scheme was published in 2021 and sets out a work program up to the end of year tw uh, 2024. It is important to ensure that both documents are kept up to date as possible, particularly when a new local plan is being prepared. The ex excuse me. The existing documents have been reviewed and updated and documents are appended to this report. The new statement of community involvement, which is in Appendix A, and the local development scheme, which is in Appendix B, have been reviewed by the Infrastructure, Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee and incorporate the recommendations made by that committee. Recommendation one has also been added at the suggestion of the scrutiny committee. The recommendations to cabinet are as follows. First, cabinet consider increasing the number of speakers and the time limit for each speaker of planning committee meetings in line with recommendations of the scrutiny committee. Two, cabinet resolve to approve the publication of new statement of community involvement as included in Appendix A, subject to any changes resulting from Recommendation 1. Three, Cabinet resolve to approve the publication of new de uh, local development scheme and is, as included in Appendix B. And finally, number four, authority is delegated to the Planning, Policy and Delivery Team Leader to make any ma minor amendments to the document before or after publication. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Are there any questions or comments from Cabinet members? Councillor Clements. Thank you, Chair. Um, the only thing I would say on the first recommendation is that it's great to have people to speak on a certain planning application, but I wouldn't be wanting to lengthen the time they could speak because potentially you've got council meetings then here till 10, 11 o'clock because everybody will want to say the same thing. So just, just just a caution, I think, on that one. Okay, Councillor Doyle, do you want to respond to that? It's not a problem. Richard, do you want to brief us on what we agreed with the uh, head of the planning committee, please? Yeah, so um, the, yeah, the chair of the planning committee uh, has agreed that uh, suggests to change the number of speakers, maximum number of speakers for and against uh, any planning application to three on, on each side. Because currently in, in the draft document, it's two. And on, on the advice of scrutiny committee, uh, there was a discussion and uh, they suggested uh, lifting that to three. And the time limit is still set as 
three minutes per person, but there is a caveat in there that the uh, the chair of the committee has has discretion to amend that on a on a case by case basis if 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 it's a particularly contentious application that needs more time. But if that's if the chair decides to increase the time limit, it applies to people for and against and the and the uh, members as well. So. Okay, thank you. Are you happy with that, Councillor Clements? Yeah. Yep. Okay, any further questions or comments? Councillor Summers? I'd only make the comment, uh, being on planning committee myself, that the representations from the public are um, quite often enlightening on the evening, um, and, you, and you don't get the representations made uh, during the formal consultation process. Um, they can quite easily sway a decision of the of the planning committee um, if, if factual evidence is presented. Um, I, I think the only problem I find with comments to planning committee on the night is that sometimes they, they tend to be more emotive rather than factual. Um, and just as we mentioned earlier regarding questions to cabinet, um, I think guidance needs to be improved um, for questions uh, or representations to, to the planning committee that um, they, they, they stick to factual lawful um, reasons why they either object or you know agree with a, pl a planning application um, we, we, we do need to make uh, make clear people's expectations at these meetings um, quite often it's the first time somebody steps into a council chamber first time they've ever seen a meeting um, and attended one as well um, I think it's a, a very good idea to give the chairman discretion over the time that they're given um, to, to present especially if those um, representing a particularly nervous as I've witnessed many times myself it's it's no small thing to come and talk to a whole meeting um, on, on a planning committee so um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm personally in favour but I think we just need to do more uh, whilst we're talking about the subject to, to make sure we manage those uh, representations um, expectations um, and, and, and tell them what to expect and uh, and why we do what we do and why we're giving them three minutes and so on uh, but other than that, I'm happy to support. Thank you. Uh, it's been proposed and seconded. All those in favour? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce the last item on the agenda uh, and take it as read. Um, and that is uh, item 11, uh, that the local plan issues and options consultation uh, be moved uh, on block recommendations one and two, that Cabinet approve uh, the launch of the issues and options consultation uh, set out in Appendix A, and that Cabinet delegate authority to the Assistant Director for Growth and Regeneration to make final uh, okay. if topography I'm okay. changes. Sorry, the, uh, I just wanted to... Oh, I'm about, that's yeah. why I'm going through this. Thank you. Uh, so, for, for formatting arrangements, so that is moved. Councillor Pritchard has seconded. All those in favour? Okay. That concludes the business of this evening's meeting. Uh, so I will close the meeting with the immediate effect.